welcome to everybody. My name is Elizabeth Kolsky, and I am a, the director of the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest at Villanova University, where I am also um, an associate professor in the Department of History. And I am delighted to have so many of you join us today for the first of our spring series of events. Some of you have been with us now for many months. Some of you may be just joining. We hope you'll stay with us. Um, we're doing a six month series of events on decolonizing history. And this is our first event of the spring series. It's also Black History Month. And so I was thinking about kind of the relationship between decolonizing history and black history. And in many ways, decolonizing history is a way of it's a kind of implicit critique. It's basically saying, you know, some have said we have Black History Month. What about White History Month? And decolonizing history really brings to the fore the notion that every month is White History Month. So we've been doing this series of decolonizing, his, decolonizing history to really question that, to question, you know, who is at the center of historical study? Um, who are the central historical subjects? How is history itself? Um, reproducing and also challenging inequalities past and present. Um, this month, we are every month we look at a kind of sub theme. So this month we're looking at the question of decolonizing empire um, and decolonizing what decolonization even means. Now I know some of these may be unfamiliar terms, so we are very happy to have an expert in the room who's going to unpack all of this for us. So I will briefly introduce her just a little bit of um, a guidance on format. We're gonna spend about 30 to 40 minutes. Professor Andy Liu, my colleague and I are gonna engage in a conversation with Professor Gattaccio. And then we're gonna open up the room to questions. So I encourage you to put questions in the chat if you'd like, and I'll field them at the end. Um, and then when we have a more open Q&A at the end, you're also welcome to just you know raise your question um, in person. But until that point, I do ask you to put to mute your microphone, which is located at the bottom left hand side of your screen. So um, our speaker for today is Professor Adam Gattaccio, who is the Neubauer Family Assistant Professor of Political Science and the College at the University of Chicago. She is a political theorist with research interests in the history of political thought, theories of race and empire and post-colonial political theory. Her work focuses on the intellectual and political histories of Africa and the Caribbean. And her recent book, World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination, um, reconstructs an account of self-determination offered in the political thought of Black Atlantic post-colonial, I mean, anti-colonial nationalists during the height of decolonization in the 20th century. It is a fantastic book. Um, when I pass the mic to her, I will put a link to the book in the chat. It's a, it, it was published in 2019. I think I've read it already a half a dozen times. And every time I read it, I am taken with just the, the elegance and brilliance of, of, the, of the content and the form, the kind of language in which Professor Gattaccio expresses herself. She holds a joint PhD in political science and African-American studies from Yale University. Um, so we are so happy to have her here with us to kick off this, um, this month's series of programming. So the way we thought we would start is by kind of building from the ground up and talking about language. So I wanted to ask Professor Gattaccio to clarify for us some of the terms that I even used in that introduction. What is decolonization? What is anti-colonial nationalism? Um, what is black internationalism? What do these terms mean? And maybe if you if you have a moment, why are they significant? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the introduction and to you um, and Andy for the invitation and all of you for joining us. Um, I know that there are lots of Zoom events uh, to go to, so I really appreciate you spending an hour with us. So I'll just try to, I mean, I think all of these contact, uh, concepts, ideas, are obviously contested categories, right? Um, and part of what I think is important about doing historical work, um, so I'm a political theorist, most of my colleagues tend to be more philosophical, right? I, but I think what's important about doing history of concepts, histories of ideas is to reveal actually 
the contested character of these concepts, right? That they meant many things to many different people, that one, one vision prevails at certain moments because of kind of politics and power, et cetera. So with those caveats though, let me try and give some working definitions. Um, so decolonization, um, you know, I take to be a project of uh, undoing the political, economic, cultural and ideological manifestations of colonial power. What does that mean on the ground? I mean, let's take um, one of my figures from the book, Kwame Nkrumah is an example of, of a kind of thinker and uh, actor on, on around this concept of, of, um, of decolonization. You know, politically for him, this meant independence, right? The end of British rule. Uh, but because British rule took the form not only just of political domination, but also economic dependence, it meant that the project of independence had to be, had to take into consideration the economic dimensions of, of, of colonialism. And as a result, he would argue that we needed an Africa-wide union, right, a federation in order to realize the goal of uh, independence. Um, he thought that the project of decolonization required creating new forms of knowledge. Um, he founded, he would found the Institute for Af African Studies at the University of Ghana as a project of teaching African languages and thinking about the connections across the African continent before colonialism happened, right? Um, and he thought also that this was a moment of cultural renovation, right? Uh, so an investment in in popular theater, for example, was one of the kind of ambitious projects that the state took on, right? I mean, so we could we could take other figures and similarly construct, I think, a political, economic, ideological, and cultural component to their critique of colonialism and their effort to overcome it. Anti-colonial nationalism, um, you know, um, so someone like Nkrumah would be considered an anti-colonial nationalist, right? He was, he argued for a, a place and space called Ghana, right? Uh, and it was, I mean, you know, there are many theorists of nationalism who talk about that as a kind of project of an imagined community, right? It was an attempt to construct and to make something like the nation of Ghana, but to imagine that. Um, it's anti-colonial in the sense that it's a project of nationalism defined against and uh, a, an imperial project that begins to articulate the space of the nation for and against the power of colonialism, right? Um, um, and so in that sense is also a kind of modern project um, and we can talk about what that, what that means. Um, and then finally, black internationalism. Um, so, you know, the main, one of the, the main intervention of my book is to say that actually these people we think that we think are nationalists and they were in fact nationalists, weren't just nationalists, right? They had a conception of internationalism. They were what I call world makers. Um, and they were that because they thought their, their project of national independence required transforming um, the international relations of power. Um, so that's one version of internationalism, right? Is to say that national independence in fact requires and uh, is embedded in an, a project of internationalism. But there's a longer, I mean, even before figures like Nkrumah come onto the stage really after World War II, there's a long history of black internationalism. And this is a project that thinks of, um, that the history of transatlantic slavery and colonialism on the continent create a shared experience and a shared political horizon. And so it's both a project that tries to think about what that shared experience is, what its legacies are, and what might be a collective political project. Um, that, pro that vision of Black internationalism was not always tied to national independence, right? There were moments in which it was an internationalism that at times was anti-national, right, or non-national, um, at other moments was kind of tied to projects of nationalism. Can I? Yep, Andy, jump yeah, in. Yeah, sorry, so this is um, something that came to mind as you're we talking and um, obviously having read through the arguments in your book, one thing I thought might be useful is to 
kind of clarify in your book, you're sort of having this running argument about, to be very simplistic, right? Sort of there's good versions of anti-colonial nationalism and maybe there's not so good versions of anti-colonial nationalism. And I was wondering if we could perhaps push you to kind of clarify that maybe with some examples of what are ways in which, because uh, we kind of have this sense with this theme of decolonizing history that any challenge to you know predominantly European empires is like a good end in and of itself, right? But you're kind of making these distinctions in your book that some of those anti-colonial projects, you know, in Africa and Asia and Latin America, um, you know, they, they have different orientations towards the international, you know, you just talked about. So I mean, is, is the distinction so much the sort of good, I don't know if you want to use a more complex term, right? Good versus bad, right? Um, is good ones are the ones that are oriented towards changing the world order bad ones are sort of inward looking and just kind of want to defend their sovereignty. The word you use sovereignty against alien rule, or they just kind of want to protect themselves without changing the rest of the world. Is that sort of the argument you would like to make? Um, you know, okay, so maybe I can step back and say like, I mean, I think many people think nationalism is a bad thing. Right? Yeah. And right now we're, we're faced with one particular form of nationalism, white nationalism, which we, I think many of us probably think is a bad thing. So one of the things the book is trying to do is uh, complicate our knee-jerk reaction to nationalism as such, right? And this idea that Andy's talking about of a good nationalism and a bad nationalism like emerges in the historiography and, and kind of theorization of nationalism in the 80s and, and, and a little earlier, but really in the 80s, as people are trying to diagnose like what happened to this project of decolonization. So that, asp that aspirational project of political, economic, cultural, ideological independence in various ways shipwrecked and was in a crisis in this period. And one can think about that crisis in a, from a, in a variety of perspectives, whether it's you know rise of authoritarianism, uh, forms of political violence, uh, deep forms of poverty and equality, et cetera, right? That there's a whole way, set of ways in which the promise of decolonization uh, the promise of anti-colonial nationalism had not been realized. So in this moment, it gives rise to a set of debates about when and where nationalism is good. And I would say this is a primarily a liberal, um, it's a debate about liberalism, really. It's like good nationalisms are the ones that are liberal, that have a civic conception of membership, that, that kind of resist the pull of ethnos, right, or ethnic identity. Bad nationalisms are the ones that are inflected with a kind of eth ethnic categories. Um, I mean, my response is in some ways to say, this is, this is an attempt at categorization before we've like encountered the archive, right? Or, or thought through how, why and how it is that these nationalisms have failed from within their own terms, right? Or with, from their own understanding of, of of nationalism. And so I think like, it's not that I wanna say that these projects were, did not fail even on their own terms. I think they did, but they didn't fail because they were just like bad nationalisms, right? Because they were all like too preoccupied with the ethnos, right? And so we have to think about um, what I, borrowing from like people like Partho Chatterjee, Mamid Mamdani call like the specificity of these projects, right? Um, but I think, you, you know, in some ways, um, like I'm interested in this question, in this relationship between internationalism and their international or outward facing projects. And it may give the impression that I think that's good uh, or that that's a preferable option. And I, w I mean, I think like, I don't wanna say that. I think I'm interested in that because I want to, I thought that was one way to push back against this this way of thinking that nationalism was always bad. Um, so is just to, to complicate its kind of connection with the international. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that my kind of account does obscure are these forms of nationalism that were resisted and rejected uh, the focus on the nation state, right? So a lot of my projects are ones that even when they're internationalist, they still think the nation state is the basis of that internationalism. That is in many say, sorry if I'm talking a lot, but uh, in many of the, um, especially in the African context, right? 
there were varieties of what we could call ethnic nationalisms that occurred below the nation state. Um, so Ashanti nationalism in the case of, of, of Ghana is a prime example. Ashanti was a kingdom that always had a very different status within the Gold Coast colony to the rest of the Gold Coast, right? It had independent protectorate status. It was incorporated into the colony much later. So in this period of decolonization, uh, the, you know, Ashanti nationalists are like, well, we want autonomy. I mean, we don't, not necessarily secession from Ghana, but we want our own independent sovereignty recognized within this new Ghanaian constitution. A figure like Nkrumah, who, who is very interested in federation with the union, with a, a, a Pan-African federation, rejects this idea as, as backward, as tribal, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's not that I think that, um, I mean, I think in some ways, it's not that I think that Nkrumah is to be preferred to the Shanti version of nationalism, but, um, and yeah, so I would just say that I think what we need to do is think about what, what kinds of claims are, is nationalism grounding, right? What is it that Ashanti nationalists are trying to achieve in this context of decolonization that they think is being um, elided or obscured by Ghanaian nationalism. So I think we could do the kind of thing I do vis-a-vis -vis like nationalists like Nkrumah, you could do in the subnational context or within the na national context to think about how it is that nationalism emerges at certain moments as answers to particular kinds of political questions. And, and it's especially interesting to think about when and how these visions conflict with each other. So I'm not sure if I answered the question fully, but I hope it's a start. Great. So, you know, you mentioned white nationalism and I think everybody in the room today watched with horror the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. And the reaction of many people was, "What well, these people are crazy. These people are crazy. But as historians, right, we know that these people who stormed the Capitol both um, have a historical mission and historical claims, by which I mean you could look, you could look at, you could look to history to explain their demands for white nationalism. And that's actually something that I think your book makes possible, right? So your book, is about efforts to remake the world made by empire. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the world that empire sought to make in terms of it being not just about white nationalism, but really about white internationalism, what you call a racial hierarchy. But I think we could talk about a kind of white internationalism. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit just about people who may not be familiar with this history about this this, this history of a, uh, the way in which racial hierarchy becomes part of particularly sort of British and American empire, what you call Anglophone empire in your book. Great. Yeah, I think, um, you know, partly why anti-colonial nationalism or, or decolonization has to be an, a global project is because empire was a global project, right? And um, there's two levels at which I think I think about this. Like one is, a claim that black intellectuals and statesmen in the 30s, 40s make about the origins of the modern world, right? To locate the birth of the modern world in the experience of col colonialism and in particular in the transatlantic slave trade and new world slavery, right? Um, I'm thinking here of books like Eric Williams's Capitalism and Slavery, C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins, Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, and and you know others as well. Um, so the, so that's one, one is to like center the the story that Black thinkers tell about the origins of the modern world. Then there's a second thing uh, I'm interested in doing, which is to say that there is, I mean. It's not race is always, of course, part of that project of slavery and colonization from the beginning, but it becomes particularly pronounced in this period of in the late 19th century and, and the early 20th century when the project of colonialism has reached its sort of it's, it's expand it's it's kind of uh, taken over most of the territory at this point. 84% of the world's surface or something is controlled by European powers right. And so in this period, um, 
the kind of racialization of in, of of uh, inter uh, the, the racialization of the international order is really really explicit, and we can see it in a variety of ways. Um, one is uh, there's an increasing um, preoccupation with race as a naturalized form of difference. Um, you know, people might call this the era of scientific racism, right? Um, I think it's you know it's not just Necessary. It doesn't always have to take the form of science or biology, but there is this kind of naturalization that happens even when people are talking about through the language of social science, right? Um, that's one. Two, uh, a real sense also, especially by the early 20th century, a sense of impending race war, right? That this is the language also that critics, I think the white theorists of the international order use to think about the question of, um, of, of the international order. Um, I mean, you see it in sort of the origins of my field, for instance, political science, right? That fields like international relations, as Bob Vitalis has shown, emerged not as relations between states, but as relations between races. That's the way the field understood itself in its early founding. Um, and I think what, you know, one thing to, to that this sort of context of the late 19th century reveals about empire is that empire wasn't just about European states competing with each other for territory, but it was like a collaborative and collective project, right? Um, that you know, was uh, institutionalized. Uh, so one very quick example of that form of collaboration is something like the Berlin Conference where the uh, territorial division of Africa occurs in 1885, right? That's a kind of a way in which Europeans collectively create the terms through which colonization happens. Um, and there's, there's other examples of that. I mean, I'll just say one other thing about about this, which is connected to the January 6th, um, you know, I don't know, takeover, um, is my book really focuses on high politics. So it's interested in spaces like the League of Nations, like the United Nations, but I think there's a, a parallel, there's a kind of popular politics to this global project of white supremacy, right? First, that shows up in deep forms of anti-immigration policy, in, in, especially in settler colonial territories, Australia, can, Canada, the United States, all in this period passing a series of exclusions, especially of Asian migrants, right? Um, um, and, you know, there's, uh, Du Bois has this excellent line from Souls of White Folk, where he says, the 19th, 19th century is the discovery of personal whiteness, right? So a way in which a sense of uh, racial entitlement, empowerment, et cetera, is, is being um, circulated and articulated in, a, in the more kind of popular, polit popular politics and expressions of this period. Um, sorry. Um, so I wonder then if you could kind of push your analysis of the you know the turn of the 20th century forward because you've already kind of begun to talk about the 21st century and you did briefly mention that you've you know you kind of acknowledge in your book that these mid-century post-war projects kind of failed or I don't know failed is the right word around their own terms how do you how do you kind of make sense of the world today do you feel like there is that potential for kind of post-imperial world making or I guess you know the the current discussion about decolonization is that, is that part of it? Is that an extension of it? Are you optimistic this time around? Or how do you kind of make sense of 2021? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's, it's, a really, it's a hard question. I, I get this question a lot, but I don't really have yet to come up with a good answer. I mean, I do think, I don't know what to make of it quite yet, but I think it is really exciting and interesting to see the ways in which the language of decolonization has reappeared, both as a kind of um, way of, especially, of course, it's appeared a lot in the context of thinking about like knowledge and knowledge production, but more generally as a kind of horizon of politics, I think it's really interesting. Um, and it's not, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I don't, I, it's, I feel like it is in some ways an extension of that project. It's an extension insofar as, as it's an attempt to reckon with the limits of that project or the failures of that project, right? I think 
the starting point for of contemporary thinking about decolonization is a real sense that a, an attempt to re-articulate that project um, from a place of acknowledging its its earlier limits. Um, so I'll just give one example about about how I think this is this how the two moments are connected, and it will be through the Caribbean uh, demands for reparations. Uh, so um, in 2013, maybe slightly earlier, the Caribbean um, community, which is the constellation of Caribbean states. Uh, uh, um, articulated a demand for reparations for slavery and uh, native genocide. I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting about this demand for reparations and reparations has has really become central to to this moment um, is that it returns to the kind of that story I was saying that early anti-colonial nationalists told about the origins of the modern world, but reframes what the kind of lesson of that history is. So for Eric Williams, who wrote Capitalism and Slavery, the fact that uh, it was slavery in, in the Americas that jump-started the Industrial Revolution and, 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 and led to the birth of the modern world, that for him is, it, it never he never made a case for reparations. Like he never thought that entitled the Caribbean to reparations. For him, that was, um, he wanted to use that story to articulate a, why we needed a West Indian Federation, right? For him, the answer was a federation. I think what the reparations figures take that same story, often very directly citing and deploying Williams's text, but make this argument about uh, about repair as the as the kind of language of um, um, a response to it. And what I think is again really powerful is that that language of repair is one that re reverses who's indebted to who, right? Uh, it may be that the Caribbean states are deeply indebted to the World Bank, to the IMF, but actually there's this, considered on a different scale, there's this larger debt that has never been paid, right? I say this to say that I think um, the, the fact that the language of decolonization persists in our period, um, is not the sign that it is the same project, right? And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how, like, a, the terms um, are are shifting uh, according to the kinds of questions people are asking and the context in which people are asking those questions. Um, so, you know, am I optimistic? I <laughs> it's hard to be optimistic. I think in this in this period, but I think. I guess I'll say I think I see a lot of kind of new languages appearing in this moment, and I think that's really exciting. We have some excellent questions in the chat. I have my own question, but I am going to cede the mic to my to my colleague, Professor Owalabi, and perhaps Kunla, you'd just like to speak your question. I'm happy to read it, but I'm yeah, sure. sure. I can absolutely speak my question. First of all, um, Adam, thank you so much for being here with us today and um, presenting your work and talking about your book. I look forward to reading more of it. I read the intro to your book over the summer um, and it kind of got me thinking um, about your work in relation to Adria Lawrence's book on anti-colonial nationalism in the French colonial empire. And I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts about um, the extent to which it's useful to think about a distinction between colonial demands for political equality versus nationalist demands for independence. This is a theme that kind of runs throughout Adria Lawrence's 2014 book. Um, and I think it's a good question because obviously the French and British were very different in terms of the way they thought about citizenship and political representation and inclusion, right? So like in French um, colonies, in the French colonial empire, there were certain colonies and or colonial populations that had citizenship rights and representation in the French National Assembly, right? So like emancipated black slaves and Afro descendants in the French Caribbean were citizens, right? But indigenous black Africans were not, or you know, in Algeria, North African Jews and all 
whites, regardless of nationality, were French citizens, but Arab, Arab and Berber Muslim populations were not. So this kind of created this tension whereby there were first demands for equality and citizenship rights. And when France rejected those, it then morphs into um, nationalist demands for independence after World War II. That's at least what Adrian Lawrence is arguing. Now, the British, of course, never had parliamentary representation for any colonies. And in some ways, they were more explicitly racist than the French were as far as political representation and inclusion were concerned. Um, but I'm st still wondering whether or not um, that distinction is useful in any ways for thinking about some of the various articulations of demands for either equality or nationalist or independence outright. Um, thinking ab about, yeah, the varied political philosophies of some of the different leaders that you write about, right? Eric Williams. Um, Aziki Way in Nigeria, um, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, and anyone else you might want to comment on. Love to hear some thoughts on yeah. that issue. Great, thanks. I mean, um, I think in some ways one can tell a very similar story to in the British, although you're right that there was never quite the same institutional infrastructure for representation and rights within the British Empire. I mean, partly because that you know, the where there was representation or some form of incorporation was for the settler colonies. Um, so in this period, you get all these kind of uh, elaborate visions of imperial federation, um, but it's not imperial federation is limited to the settler colonies. I mean, uh, none of the uh, crown colonies, not even India is, is, is really thought to be, part, would have been thought to be part of the imaginations of greater Britain. Um, but still, you know, for early anti-colonial critics, let's say, um, I mean, start off with demands for inclusion and equality within the empire. Uh, give you a few examples. I mean, the National Congress of British West Africa, a formation, uh, uh, the regional formation, uh, started by uh, Casey Hayford, a lawyer, a Ghanaian lawyer. Uh, in its demands in, in 1920, it asks for suffrage rights at the same time that it pledges uh, imperial lo loyalism to the British Empire and to the crown. Um, a figure associated with Black nationalism like Marcus Garvey, when he first forms the Universal Negro Improvement Association in 1914, uh, does so as an imperial subject and with the ambition of ensuring and realizing the rights of imperial subjects, uh, West Indian imperial subjects. So I think there's a similar story to tell about earlier articulations of rights and inclusion within the British Empire. I think there aren't as many in, in, um, you know, institutional outlets for that project. Um, so you, but you could tell the same story Adria does about like a, a kind of claim about equality then shifting to independence. But I think what, what it helps us do is rethink what that at call for independence was in the first place, right? I mean, so if the goal had been equality, is there a way to think that independence was also an attempt to achieve a certain form of equality? So in my view, I think decolonization was really a, in many ways a project of equality, realizing political, economic, and social equality. And when you could no longer do it within the framework of the British Empire, you try to think about how you might do it through national independence. How does that happen, right? One, it's a claim, a, an articulation of equal citizenship within the territory, within the new nation, right? The, the kind of citizenship denied to uh, subject col col colonial subjects could now possibly be realized within uh, the the nation state form, right? That's one. Two, and this is the part that my book really focuses on, is like an argument for sovereign equality. 
a sovereign equality that it allows you to, to make demands on economic redistribution on the global stage, that allows you to make demands for po equal poli decision making uh, on the international stage, right? So there's a way, I guess, to say that even independence is about equality, actually. It's just a, an attempt to think about equality on a different institutional horizon and in institutional context. I know. I, I, yeah, great. Thanks. Oh, um, I have I have a question that I'd like to open it up. I know we said we'd have 30 to 40 minutes. One, as a historian, one of the things I found really interesting about your book is that the connections you draw between the politics of decolonization and the contemporary historians who are writing about it, namely, in particular, CLR James, um, Du Bois, who is a sociologist, but, you know, we'll call him a, a historian ish type for a person. Um, Eric Williams, right? So that these are people who, you know, that you talk about how in between the formation of the League of Nations and the United Nations, they started to frame empire as a form of enslavement, right? And this, and it's historians who are doing this work. So I'm just wondering, you know, following up on Andy's question, which was kind of, well, where are we in 2021? You know, with decolonization a failure, where are we today? And I'm wondering where we are in the discipline of, of history, um, you know, to the extent, I, I just, again, thinking about Black History Month, thinking about these incredible historians, including James, and who I'm imagining many people in the audience today may not have read, right? These historians to this date are not in your standard curriculum, I would, I would bet. Um, and so I wonder if there's some link between these two. I mean, in Britain, we have debates raging, these so-called cultural wars. You have, you know, in Britain, these who are saying, you know, those who want to look at empire's enslavement, these are it's very un-British. These people are haters of the nation. We have a similar debate in the United States, the critique of 1619. So, you know, that, that though that the 169 printing project is unpatriotic and we need patriotic education. And you have a similar debate going on, you know, of course, in, in Britain. So I'm wondering if we are to say that decolonization is a failed effort and the decolonization that you're describing in your book, a, a vision of creating a more just and egalitarian world, how much is the discipline of history and we as historians and history educators, are we implicated in that failure? Um, well, I guess one, um, one thing, I mean, I'm, I, I was particularly interested in the figures I write about because they are scholars of various kinds. You know, they all are people who, like many, some of them, you know, of, of course, Du Bois and, and uh, Williams have PhDs. Nkrumah and Ezekwe begin to do our PhD work and then never never actually completed. But it doesn't matter about whether they have the PhD or not. What, what matters is that there are like scholars and people who thought that writing, writing was intimately connected to their political projects, right? So, I mean, I think that this is the, I mean, we, yeah, yeah, there are people who think politics and his and history writing or rethinking history happen together. So I think that's a really important lesson for our own moment in some ways that, um, you know, we tend to think that the kind of language of decolonizing knowledge is a, a new sort of debate. Um, but it's to say that like that moment of associated with formal decolonization, the end of empire was also one that was saturated with a rethinking of history. and. I think what's really grabs me about this set of actors um, is that they think the present, the past really, how we tell the story of the past bears a lot on what we take to be our present situation and how we might act in the present. Um, so, you know, I guess, I mean, I think I'm not a historian, but I think sometimes there's, um, a skepticism with, you know, you can tell me, those of you who are historians can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think um, an anxiety in, in among historians with uh, acknowledging the deeply political character of history writing, right? And both of, of the people who've written in the past and perhaps our own, right? So, um, I mean, I guess it's to say that to be more forthcoming about that polit the political stakes of our writing. Um, and uh, to make clear, not to necessarily not, and I don't think the point is like we ought to then be taking norm normative positions or or staking out political positions necessarily in our writing, but I think 
and maybe another way to do it is like to ask ourselves, so why write this history now, right? Uh, what are the present political context or, um, I mean, David Scott, who's really important to my thinking about this period, uses the language of problem space, right? How do we understand our problem space in this moment that requires um, the, the um, um, uh, like, that requires this new his history? So I, if I, yeah, and sorry, this is almost a much more basic question, but one thing I was curious about, you mentioned that most political scientists and theorists don't think historically. So I am almost curious just to ask on a biographical level, what compelled you to think historically um, um, and to take this approach? Basically, why is history great? Just tell a bunch of historians this. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one, I have to say, I mean, being in an, uh, in two de departments or to being in an interdisciplinary context where my other field was African American studies really shaped how I did my work, who I thought I was in conversation with, um, all of that, like, um, and I really, it's hard to imagine how I would have done this project or how I would do any of my work really if it was not for the field of African American studies and the ways that that space really opened up um, you know a, a whole set of questions that are not normally the questions political science asks so you know just to say i think um african american studies is super important uh to my own formation but i think you know maybe this isn't biographical but it's in some ways like i don't know if i thought about this before i started the project but one way i've come to think about why history is important to me is that i mean in some ways like if you think political theory is kind of has a set of concepts it's trying to work through, right? Sovereignty, democracy, whatever, we can, human rights, right? Like, and on the one hand, like they take those to be kind of universal categories. Um, and if you look around the world, you're like, well, they kind of are like, lots of people around the world are asking for democracy. The whole world is organized around sovereign statehood, right? So there's a way of taking like our, the geographic preponderance of our categories to mean that they're universal categories. I think the only way to get out of that and to offer different ways of thinking about the concepts is to say that what, what we take to be universality because of geographic universality actually has, actually the way it emerges is, is very specific. And that means that sovereignty in one place is not sovereignty in another. It's also to say that like the reason that they're everywhere is because of empire, right? So in order both to account for that uh, geographical universality and then to be able to say what makes the problem of sovereignty in the African context a different problem than the one that the European early founders of the European Union are debating at the same time, you can only do that through history and like through a reconstruction of the concepts in historical context and in their specificity. So that's that's how I came to understand like what history does for me. Thank you. So we here at the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest are seeking to sort of bridge contemporary issues and put contemporary issues in a historical light to enhance kind of public understanding and debate. And to do so, we also ask that the public engage with us. So we have 15 minutes here. We would love to hear your questions and, and thoughts. Um, and the floor is open to all of you. You can, uh, there's a raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen, or you can post a question in, in the chat if you'd like. But now is your time. So when I started out teaching, I was, I was told to say, um, do you have, I was told not to say, do you have any questions, but to rephrase it, what questions do you have? So I will ask you, yes, Alfonso. If, what? If I could, thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation. I was curious to know if we, I don't want to know if the answer is fast forward, but what would the world look like today? Or what does the ideal world look like today or in the future to you? <laughs> Um, easy question. Easy question. Uh, I, it's really hard. To, I mean, this is partly why I like to do history. 
my colleagues love to think about what they would like the world to be like in ideal theory. And I, I kind of, I'm, you know, I'm anxious about that, I guess. Um, what would I, it's so hard to answer. I mean, you know, I guess this is like a very incomplete answer and it's informed by just having taught um, Audra Simpson's book, Mohawk Interruptus. That's what I was teaching right before this, uh, which is a kind of an account of, of sovereignty under the conditions of settler colonialism. Um, so I guess one kind of thing in, uh, that I would like to see the world um, look like is to have, you know, conceptions of, I think, you know, I'm, I'm really attached and committed to the, to an idea of self-government and to the idea of collective self-rule, um, you know, as an anti-imperial concept, but of course it's one that's deeply unrealized in a variety of contexts, not just in the settler colonial one we live in, but also, of course, in the post-colonial states that, um, you know, that were formed in the period I write about. So, you know, something like a realization of the ideal of collective self-rule, uh, not necessarily in the form of sovereign states, right, but in, in, in different conceptions of, of um, you know, Oh, it could be overlapping nested forms of sovereignty, right? Like, uh, but I think that's a that's a that's one kind of um, promise of the project of decolonization, and I think one that I would like to see realized, even though I don't have a blueprint for what that looks like. Okay, we have a question in the chat, um, and the question is. Uh, I suppose all of you can see it, but I'll read it anyway, that I uh, would like to hear your thoughts on the role of culture in these nation building and world building political projects. You had mentioned Nkrumah's African language stuff. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, so I'll just say this, I'm working on a project around this right now with uh, two curators at the Art Institute. Um, it's a project called Pan Africa, Future of a Black Planet. And it's trying to think about the cultural and aesthetic practices and politics of Pan-Africanism. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I guess like, and, and the other thing, I, my own second project is about Garveyism in the 1920s and 30s. And the first piece of that, pro the first piece I've written around that is, um, um, you know, about thinking about performance and especially about like self-styling um, in the parades and the conventions as this form of, as this attempt to prefigure and perform black empowerment uh, in a context in which, um, you know, the aspiration for decolonization is not on the horizon yet. So let's see, I'm more familiar. Okay, and the, um, yes. Uh, so anyway, the, the Sangor, part of that, Dakar, Dakar is one of our sites for this project I'm engaged with, with in, the, in the collaborative project. But um, I mean, I think one of the, just, I guess like in some ways, what for me is important about this project on cultural politics is to think about the question of political representation and cultural representation as appearing together and simultaneously for these figures that, um, so it helps us to also rethink what the, as you know, what 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 the aspiration for political representation was um, in the projects of around culture. I have a question or comment. Please, please. You know, recently I watched the um, a documentary on someone who I have a lot of respect for, Thomas Sowell. Um, you know, common sense in the senseless world, and. He's written, what, 50 books? I've read actually a handful. Um, what I get a sense of someone like him by the Black community and BLM is that his comments are very much counter to his what his life was like. He had nothing, but he took advantage of education. He took advantage of what some of you, I think, even on this call are saying are not opportunity. He took advantage of them. Degrees from Harvard, Chicago, Columbia. Tremendous story, had nothing. And now I see he also is getting blocked out. I know some universities don't even want him to speak on campus because he's counter to the message they want to hear. I'd be curious what you think of that. 
I mean, which part is the blocking of? Yeah, just in general. I mean, his view, as I said, I know for a fact in one case he was trying to be involved. He was asked to speak at uh, something was being put together by one of the, say, regional Black Lives Movement, and they didn't want him to speak because the view was he's, he's preaching something very different, okay, in terms of what maybe some of the message is. Yeah, I mean, you know, our, our, all of our universities are kind of wrestling with this question of free speech and what that means. Um, why would you block him out to be such a brilliant man who's written 50 books? That's my question. Why would you block that view out? Well, I can't, I can't really speak to what, what the reasoning there was, but it seems like if you have a platform, right, like you get to decide who speaks at your platform. I mean, I think that's Oh, so you cut out somebody like him, basically. I got it. Okay, I got it. I mean, you can decide, right? <laughs> you could or could not. And I mean, you know, the this is like in the context of universities, but there are lots of people we don't invite to universities for a variety of reasons, right? And so uh, whether like it, the idea of, of free speech doesn't mean that every platform is open to everybody all the time, right? Well, I'm not talking about it from a free speech standpoint. You're, you're changing oh. the subject. I'm talking about his views and his comments, which he's a social theorist too, I might add, not just a economist. And his views seem to be a little different in terms of, I think, some of these that I'm hearing on the call. Um, so I'm just curious, there is a counter view, which seems to be the students are not almost allowed to see. Like I saw the documentary, I'd recommend it to the student body at Bill and it was phenomenal. I don't know if you will, because it's a little counter to what I've heard on the call, but I would recommend it strongly. Yeah, I mean, um, what are you what are you asking for? I'm just saying I think that we could have also think you know his kind of perspective and someone that kind of thinking, which is a little counter to what, as I said earlier, some people think is another worthwhile right. view that we've I recommend. Invited, to we've invited someone to talk about their work for one hour. There's plenty of time to talk about other work as well. Is that fair? Uh, well, no, I'm just saying there's another counterpoint. Yeah, I said, said well, I'm hearing on the call. I'm just curious what you think in terms of his view seems to be counter to a lot of what is being said. And what do you, how do you feel about that? And it's been addressed, is that right? Yeah, I think there are many counterpoints to, um, you know, the, the arguments made here and the arguments I'm reconstructing in my book. Um, yeah, so and I don't really have a comment about him personally, though. Yeah, let's get another question. Yes, Thomas. Hi. So I, I'm just curious, like, um, did the work of like er Eris Manella's The Wilsonian Moment influence your um, work at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like my work follows, uh, you know, a like a emerging body of scholarship on um, like global history, trying to tell this sort of, and he has this line about the internationalism of anti-colonial nationalism. I mean, what those, the point I try to make in my book is that Manila, I take to be telling a story of diffusion, right? One in which there's a Wilsonian ideal and then it just gets repeated and taken up by anti-colonial thinkers. So one of the things I'm trying to um, complicate is to say that it wasn't just a straightforward appropriation and uh, adoption of a Wilsonian ideal, but really an, a reinvention and transformation that there is an anti-imperial conception of self-determination. The other thing I try to do in the, for, in the kind of uh, one of the chapters, chapter two is tell um, the story, like to, to show the ways in which the Wilsonian ideal was deeply implicated in this project of global white supremacy. Actually, I have a question. Well, I have a, a comment jumped out to me was from um, Manjit Ramkotra. She said she doesn't have a question, but I actually thought it was pretty interesting. She had said, I don't know if Manjit, you wanna jump in here, but she had said that what's interesting is we're, uh, so this is earlier, she says the collapse of empire Mid 20th century is really important, especially to how the international as post colonial order was reconceptualizing who did it. I think we are now talking about this as the demography of academia or academe has changed as well. And that is something I've been thinking about in terms of, um, you know, I come from a different perspective, but, you know, you know we're roughly like the same age, the same generation or so. But we, uh, what, what has your experience been sort of 
navigating academia, and, and you talked about this briefly in your preface about how, um, you know, that you are second generation and you're trying to kind of figure out some of these questions through the, an institution that is very deeply entrenched in like Northeast um, American institutions. And how do you, how do you, have you found difficulty kind of like carving out your own space to explore these questions that, you know, probably someone with a different background might not be as interested in exploring um, um, as yourself? Yeah, um, I mean, I think this also, um, you know, um, echoes the point you, you were making earlier about what's different in this moment. Um, and I think one of the things that's really fascinating about some of the protests we've seen, um, especially in, in Europe is that it's like the empire, <laughs> the empire has arrived at the metropole. And, you know, it's a, it's a long standing, of course, it began in the 60, 50s, 60s already, but, but that the kind of project of decolonization isn't just one that's being carried out out there, but it's being brought in the houses of power in the, in the metropole. Um, in my, my own experience, you know, I, uh, yeah, I, I one I'll say I we moved we moved to the United States in uh, August two thousand and one, so one month before <laughs> September eleventh, and September eleventh itself was my second week of school in America or something like that, in um, in Northern Virginia. We actually lived in Arlington. Oh wow! <laughs> so, so we lived well with the smoke of the of yeah. the Pentagon over us. So I say that in part because I mean my experience of being in the United States uh, was one, it's like I've lived with the shadow of the US being at war the whole time I've been here, right? Like I don't know a pre-war United States and that in some sense, I'm like our students, right? Our students are 20 now and they, they've lived under the shadow of a re resurgent American imperialism the whole, their whole lives. Um, um, I forgot what the second thing I was going to say was. Well, the second thing I guess about you know the experience of being a second generation student in the um, academy was, I guess, yeah, you you know you asking or or and I think it for me manifested primarily in the fact of sitting in the nexus of two um, disciplines, right, um, and trying to bring certain kinds of perspectives within political science, which. I should say like I was very supported and I continue to be very supported by my colleagues, but that can be a very lonely endeavor, right? Uh, if you're doing it, you know, by yourself. And so being able to create community, intellectual communities that uh, bridged those two divisions or, or created alternative spaces um, were really, really important to me both in graduate school and have been since graduate school. The other thing I should say, which is important for the, the book is um, many of the people I write about also went to school in America and especially they went to school, historically black colleges and universities, right? Howard University, Lincoln University, Eric Williams taught for 10 years at Howard University. So it's also to say that, and I'll say Howard University was the first college campus I went to. I did a summer program there while in high school. I mean, I didn't know obviously that, that this would come back in any, any kind of way, but it's just also to think about these alternative institutional formations, uh, which are partly a legacy of slavery and colonialism, right, but that have nurtured for long periods of time alternative conceptions of, 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 of the questions we ask. Um, I'll just recommend for people who are interested this book by Robert Vitalis called uh, White World Order, Black Power Politics, which tells the history of the discipline of international relations, but especially focuses on what he calls the Howard School of International Affairs. So it's to say that I think sometimes we think of ourselves as, you know, like I, I guess we build on on these traditions, and it's important to acknowledge the people who did the work before we did the work, right? And and for me, that's also a way of saying not feeling isolated, right? To figure out what my own intellectual genealogy is. Okay, well, thank you so much for Professor Gatasho for this super interesting talk. I really hope all of you will go out and buy her book, which is truly fantastic. It's, it's written in a beautiful and elegant fashion and it, and it provides this really important history. I also hope all of you will stay with us 
Um, we are going to be continuing to engage with these themes of empire, decolonization, nationalism over the course of the month of February. Um, our next event is next Wednesday um, at 6 p.m. So uh, you all found your way here. I'm sure you can find your way to register for the next event. We are so grateful that you all joined us and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.